Good afternoon. Today is Wednesday, the 11th of November. More importantly, it is the 11th day of the 11th month, aside from being my wife's birthday. It is also Armistice Day. It is the day when World War I is called to a halt, the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. All Quiet on the Western Front, which was a famous book that actually gets asked about a lot in AP Euro class, All Quiet on the Western Front. Now, um, by this time, we should be well into the middle of our week. Um, well, and it's Wednesday, you're at home, uh, and hopefully you're listening to this, hopefully. Um, but yes, we are in the middle of the first week where A and B groups have come back. I'm looking forward to this by now. Uh, we've had two days of A and B group together in class, two days of fresh Horton, although the folks at home still get canned Horton. I have high hopes for, you know, optimism for uh, doing this. I think that it will improve our retention. Um, I'll be able to be here and pound more stuff into your head and better prepare you for the AP Euro test. Um, and so, yeah, but today we're going to finish this unit. I do want you to note that, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on for you, for us. Uh, for this class uh, in this week. Notice it says right there in big bold black letters, the test for this unit, the age of uh, reason, age of science and reason will be Friday. That also on Friday, you have your first LEQ. It's a take home LEQ. And I've also already, although it's probably not available to you, uh, well, actually, I send out the study guide, the terms, and the take-home test uh, for you um, tomorrow. Did I? Well, I'm pretty sure I did. At any rate, uh, yeah, I did. I'm sure I did. Maybe I did it yesterday, but I'm sure I did. I'll check. But yeah, the study guide, the terms, and the take-home test. Yeah, uh, but anyway. Yeah, 11. Oh, yeah, this is Tuesday. Tuesday. I'm sorry, this is Tuesday. We're going to finish this on Tuesday. Good. Horton, you are losing. Yeah, this is the 10th. That's Tuesday. Forgive me. Well, now that we got that straight now, let's finish the unit, shall we? Or I'll make any more stupid mistakes. So. Roman numeral 31. This is definitely one of the longest units that we'll have this year, but it covers intellectual history. While the university system that we now know was actually one of the few contributions to the modern world of the medieval ages. Yeah, the current university system that we currently have is a creation of the Middle Ages. But the age of reason then put its own stamp on the institution of universities and colleges. The school system in Europe perpetuated the class system in Europe. You say, what does that mean? It meant that the way it was set up, uh, whereas today, today getting an education is a way out of poverty. The uh, university system of the age of reason basically um, perpetuated the fact that the rich remain rich and everybody else does not. Uh, as it says there, rather than provide a way out of poverty. For example, only the privileged could afford <coughs> to go to secondary schools. And then that meant that only the privileged could then go to universities. Because, well, how do you get to universities? Well, you take the learning you get in secondary schools, high schools, and then you go to universities. Well, if you never got to go to a secondary school, then you surely weren't going to universities. Uh, as it says there, that in Bali 3, that's Horton's commentary. I probably shouldn't put it in there, but 
it's the truth. That works so well, and the American South will institutionalize it with the earliest forms of state-sponsored universities. And you say, now, what does that mean, Mr. Horton? Well, I'll tell you right off the bat. Mr. Arlinghouse has nothing to do with this unit. But it's more to do with American History AP. Yeah, in the southern states, the southern colonies, the south, which became the southern states of the United States, if you notice, the southern states had the first state-sponsored universities. However, the southern states, those same southern states that created the first state-sponsored universities that were paid for at taxpayer expense, those same southern states were the last ones to add publicly funded secondary education. What that meant was to get into one of those state-sponsored universities, you had to, of course, go to high school. But the high school, you had to pay for it. What if you didn't have the money to pay for it? Well, then you weren't going. And so, as it says there, yeah, it really did. You ever think of that, Mr. Arlinghouse? It's quite true. <clears throat> yeah, in American history, in the South, they institutionalized um, poverty for a certain segment of the population and institutionalized success and wealth for a different segment of the population. Secondary schools of this era still focused on learning exclusively Greek and Latin with little to no mathematics. The most common complaint about the 18th century higher education was that it was so tied to the classical age and not to, and not to modern research. Look, I wave something, yeah, it catches the light. And not to modern research. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, if you wanted to go find research institutions, the universities didn't do it. The universities were just there to teach what people already had established, not to find new knowledge. As it says there, therefore, it's easy to see why very little new scientific discoveries were founded in these universities during this era. In the late 19th and 20th centuries, however, R&D, research and discovery, will become part and parcel of the mission of the university systems. But not in the 18th century, not during the Enlightenment. Now let's talk about crime and punishment. Crime and punishment for this era still remain tied to the medieval mythology, the way they did it, and ideology, which is how they thought about it, which makes it seem pretty much barbaric for, the, for a period that called itself the Enlightenment. There were two levels of punishments. Nobles, for example, were just simply beheaded. Why? Because you didn't want to, even if the nobles committed a crime, you didn't want to embarrass them by putting on a public display of torture uh, where they would scream a lot. On the other hand, commoners were tortured, broken on the rack, drawn and quartered, burned at the stake, you know, things where the, it was a public spectacle because, after all, they're commoners and they deserve it. By 1800, and this is an interesting statistic, by 1800, over 200 crimes in England still warranted the death penalty, which is interesting. It's an interesting uh, phenomenon. You know, in England, as it says there, 200 crimes still warranted the death penalty. One of those crimes that warranted the death penalty was pickpocketing. Now, here's the thing. Of course, any kind of public execution would draw a big crowd that would be very mesmerized with getting to see somebody else executed. But while the spectacle was going on, guess what the pickpockets were doing? They were rifling the crowd, yeah. Yes, uh, we'll talk another time about does uh, punishments deter crime, and the answer is simply no. But yeah, that's a perfect example. Commoners were also condemned to hard labor or sent to forced labor in Georgia. Yeah, you know, Georgia, the colony of Georgia uh, was founded in America as a penal colony, a colony designed to uh, be a home uh, for criminals. And while that sounds rough, uh, you have to remember that most of these criminals who were sent 
to Georgia by the English. I mean, the English were being very clever. Uh, prisons were overflowing in England, and most of the prisoners were people who owed money. In England at the time, if you owed somebody money, you got sent to prison. Debtor's prison, it was called. And, of course, you've stayed in that prison until your debt was paid. Well, guess what? Nobody was going to pay the debt for you. You were just in there. And so this process, very, the English quickly realized that the government had to spend a lot of money just to keep people in prison, and they weren't producing any. And so uh, it's actually an interesting story. Um, you see, the last colony to be established was Georgia. Georgia was like an afterthought, actually, of the 13 colonies. The, Of course, the most southern colonies were North and South Carolina. North and South Carolina, as colonies, were both rather profitable. Uh, for example, South Carolina produced rice, indigo, and yes, cotton. Uh, North Carolina produced not only cotton, but also naval stores. And no, naval stores is not what you find on your body. Naval stores are the materials needed to make ships. Three things primarily. Wood, rope, which was made out of hemp. You do know that, don't you? Yeah, much of the rope that bound ships together was made out of hemp. Uh, which is why oftentimes sailors would, when they were very cold, uh, you know, out in the ocean, uh, you'd get very cold. When they were very cold, they would clip off a piece of that rope and smoke it. Hemp. Pot. Uh, <clears throat> and the last thing, uh, naval stores, tar. Mr. Arlington, did you ever wonder where and why they call them North Carolina Tar Heels and what that stupid little symbol on their uniforms meant? Yeah, that. Anyway, um, yeah, before the American Revolution, um, Georgia was a penal colony. After the American Revolution, does anyone know? where the English sent their prisoners, debtors. Australia. Oh, yeah, right. The Botany Bay Expedition. thing of it was, uh, Australia not only was literally half a world away, and most of the prisoners who went there, it was a one-way trip, but also, you know, Australia um, was a very harsh environment. Very harsh. You knew, of course, Mr. Arlinghouse, that seven of the world's ten most deadly venomous snakes call Australia home. Not to mention the brown recluse spider, uh, uh, saltwater crocodiles, and, and let us not forget about the great white shark of the Bar Great Barrier Reef. Yes. So, a person could be sent to debtor's prison. Oh, look what... Who, does anybody know who I'm quoting there? Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? I mean, that's a that's a quote from Charles Dickens, Christmas Carol, where Dickens is, I'm sorry, where Scrooge is confronted in the corn exchange by two guys who want him to give to charity. And of course, Scrooge is Scrooge, and he answers them, well, are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? And, you know, he was, is real. Yeah. Yes, but most would rather die than go there. Well, if they're going to die, then let them do it, Thomas Malthus said, and decrease the surplus population. Right? Anyway, Cesar Beccaria wrote, this is on your matching portion of the test, on crimes and punishments, which said that punishments should exist as deterrence, not as cruelty for their own sake. Both ideas are wrong. But Cesar Beccaria's idea, I mean, it was progressive. Uh, I mean, before this, punishments, public punishments, criminal punishments, were there just to punish the people who had committed some crime. Cesar Beccaria thought that, you know, a punishment should exist as a deterrent. Maybe on some level, punishments are deterrents. But trust me, no. 
John Howard, also on your desk, wrote on the state of prisons in England and Wales, which also exposed the cruelties of incarceration and punishment. For example, oftentimes uh, in Europe, when the uh, state government didn't have enough money for a prison, they would load their prisoners up into ships, uh, particularly in Northern Europe, and then the ship would be anchored out in the middle of the harbor. And you say, well, I mean, uh, can't they just swim away? Well, unless you've taken a dip in the Baltic, you would understand, not understand the, uh, yeah, not a good idea. It's cold. You would not last. Anyway, Roman Rule 23, medicine of the 18th century was a hit or miss proposition. There was very little real knowledge about how to treat various ailments or wounds. And there, but there was a hierarchy of metal, medical experts during this age. First of all, at the top were physicians. Were few and licensed through not only formal college instruction in Latin and Greek, but also from the Royal College of Physicians. So they had some training. Surgeons, on the other hand, were still of the barber class. Remember all those guys? Uh, you know, who's the barber here? Mr. Arlinghouse, uh, you should you should really ha show your kids. There's a skit by Steve Martin from Saturday Night Live. Theodoric of York, medieval barber. I mean, it's it's only lasts about seven or eight minutes. It's funny, and it also talks about, I mean, you know, we all, you and I, Mr. Arlinghouse, both know what happened to George Washington, right? Yeah. Um, barbers still practice bleeding out the bad humors. Uh, and by the way, they not only did that to George Washington, they also did it to Catherine the Great, 1796. Then there were apothecaries, which are, well, today we call them pharmacists. They concocted medicines uh, that oftentimes mostly comprised of various levels of alcohol. Um, but yeah, midwives for delivering children and, of course, faith healers. Hospitals during this time were nests of infestation and filth. Interesting statistic, I'll throw at you right off. Uh, literally right up until the Crimean War of 1852 to 1854, a, soul, a wounded soldier's chance of survival was actually better if he were left on the battlefield than if he were taken to a surgical hospital, an arm, a military hospital. Yeah. All right, Roman 24. Popular culture could be found in many facets of European culture of the age. Feast days. Uh, feast days, these were mostly in Catholic countries. Feast days of various saints, uh, you know, were hugely prepared for and anticipated. Carnivals. Mardi Gras. Yes, Mardi Gras. Mr. Arlinghouse can tell us what that is. He knows that in French it means Fat Tuesday, and he also knows that Mardi Gras is basically the week prior to the beginning of Lent. And if you know anything about Roman Catholicism, Lent is a period of denial in preparation for the Easter um, celebration. But yeah, 40 days. And so before, and Lent begins on Ash Wednesday, which varies in time from year to year, but beginning Ash Wednesday until Easter basically is a no fun zone uh, in ancient, you know, I don't mean to throw rocks at anybody's religion, but you know, that's a time when in the Catholic world there's uh, <clears throat> a lot of denial of oneself anyway. And so what they would do on the week prior to Ash Wednesday, party down. So, and of course, body songs with double meanings. For example, the songs they used to sing about uh, Louis the Sixteenth, the King of France, and his inability to, uh, seemingly inability to uh, have children with Marie Antoinette. Uh, we'll get to that. Yeah, keymaker. It's a, it's an analogy. Yeah, key lock. All right, Roman thirty-five. Commerce of this age did some serious drinking of alcohol. You have to remember, 
that for most of human history, people drank more alcohol than water. Why? Because water was dangerous. Yeah, drinking water was a good way to get dysentery and di a deadly dysentery. And so people didn't. They drank alcohol. Now, even from a very young age, they drank alcohol. Gin in England and vodka in Russia, straight up. In England, the saying was, and gin, by the way, see, gin was the drink of the poor classes because it was a much cheaper buzz. Beer actually was the drink of the upper classes because it cost some money and had less alcohol. But Jen was straight up, and look at the saying, dead drunk for a penny, dead for two. In other words, some of these drinks were so potent uh, that, yeah, <clears throat> two cents worth, and, you know, a penny bought a lot more back then. But, yeah, two pennies. In England, the consumption of gin went from two to five million gallons of gin from 1714 to 1733. The rich drank also. They just drank more expensive stuff. Beer, port wine, etc. Sherry. Romeo 36. The spread of popular culture was also accomplished by songs and cheap printed materials. Chat books were pamphlets written on cheap paper that had songs, spiritual verses, spiritual material. Literacy, however, while increasing, was still a man's dominion. Women still, as it says there, female literacy rates lag behind in nearly in every no in every country in Europe. And see that's the kind of thing when you know that AP uh, AP uh, courses do LAQs, long essay questions. Those are the kind of evidences, for example, to talk about uh, the progress of women's rights, women's uh, movements during the Enlightenment. Answer yeah, female literacy rate lag behind in every country. In most of Catholic Europe, literacy rates grew slowly. Only in Habsburg, Austria, thank you, Joseph II, there was there an effort to educate at the state expense. Since Protestants were more concerned, once again, what did Martin Luther say? Every man's his own priest, therefore, if you're your own priest, you need to be able to read the Bible so you can go to heaven. Since Protestants were more concerned with, yeah, every man being his own priest, the later literacy and education of children got more attention. To give proper credit in this country, our you know affection for teaching children how to read traces all the way back to the Puritans in Massachusetts. And those fun guys, Thanksgiving's coming up, those fun guys, and I'm being facetious, Puritans, those fun guys thought though it was necessary to teach the children how to read so they could read the Bible. And for many children, that was the first book. Roman numeral 37. Churches by this time were institutionalized. That meant that uh, the church uh, was grounded into society. The church, you know, uh, had functions, social functions, it was recognized by state governments. But we're also coming under attack from the intellectuals of the day. Crush the infamous thing, said Voltaire, as if that was going to be on your test. Churches ha did, however, perform the valuable service of keeping birth, marriage, and death records because nobody else was doing it. And it is a valuable service. So, yeah, churches. Some churches also offered schools, but these mainly were for the wealthy. The relationship between the... Uh, church and state varied across Europe. In some states, the Catholic Church still held an enormous amount of influence. For example, in France. For example, in Spain. Uh, for example, in southern Germany. Or what is now Germany. Uh, in the Protestant German world, the state actually dictated practice to the local churches. In Spain and France, though, the Catholic Church still remained powerful. The Jesuits in these and other states had become so influential that they actually were expelled in some areas. Yeah, it's kind of, I'm telling you, Mr. Arlinghouse would appreciate this. Um, you know, it's funny having, and I'm not Catholic, but having hung around with lots of priests around Covenant Catholic, 
if you just say the word Jesuits, it's like they're it's you're, it's like they're a cat and the hat, hair stands up on their back and they go those Jesuits. <coughs> they think they're so smart. Jesuits, Society of Jesus, a religious order, as Mr. Hollinghouse can tell you, founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola. And also the founder of any school that's called St. X or Xavier University, Jesuits. Covenant Catholic, on the other hand, and St. Henry are what are called Marianist schools, schools of Mary. All right, back to matter hand. There were cries for religious tolerance, however. In France, the last burning of a heretic occurred in 1781. Aren't those French progressive? Joseph II, yeah, uh, Amadeus, Joseph II, the musical king. Yeah, we've got, yeah, he's, there'll be a question on your test that asks for the most uh, enlightened of all the monarchs. And once again, the answer is Joseph II of Austria. He actually tried to make enlightened changes in his empire. Joseph II enacted his toleration patent of 1781, which allowed religious toleration to the private practice of Protestantism and EOC stands for Eastern Orthodox Church or Greek Orthodox. He also adopted liberal policy towards Jews, but it was short lived. It died when he did, as did his other acts of toleration. Jews, of course, lived outside the realms of Christian Europe and were widely despised. And by the way, make sure you note in your writing that as a whole, the so-called philosophs were anti-Semitic. Please tell me you know what that word means, anti-Semitic. They didn't like Jews. Anti-Semitic. So, uh, lived on the outside the realm of Christian Europe and were widely despised. What is a pogrom? That is a word that describes a Russian government-sponsored killing of Jews. And throughout history, you know, Russia had more Jews than any other country. And in Russia, Jews received worse treatment for most of European history than any other country. And many of those pogroms. Anytime in Russia there'd be a famine, some kind of downturn, unfortunate event, they would immediately point at Jews and there would be a campaign to wipe Jews off the face of the earth. And that would be called pogroms. The largest group of Jews were the Ashkenazic, Jew, uh, Ashkenazic Jews and lived primarily in Eastern Europe. Another group were called the Sephardic Jews, who had been expelled from Spain during the Inquisition. They migrated to Amsterdam, London, Venice, and Frankfurt. There, in those cities, they practiced banking and commercial ventures uh, as they had done since the Middle Ages. Court Jews are Jews who, through circumstance, were wealthy and had loaned money to the heads of Europe, and many Jews had. And because of that, many of the heads of Europe allowed Jews to sit in their court, gave them official seats. Okay. Ah, oh, yes. Roman. Look, we're finished. Religiosity in the rest of Europe during this age also came under attack. Catholic attendance at mass began to waver. Protestants continued to debate the Catholics and each other over practices, and they continued to splinter. In England, the new Anglican faith seemed as impious to many who sought more conservative faiths. Of course, the Puritans, later on the Baptist movement and the Quaker movements, and then, in the 18th century, John Wesley. John Wesley founded the new church called the Methodist Church, and by the way, it migrated over to the eastern seaboard of the United States. I was just watching a program about it last night. Wesley's church appealed to the desire for piety amongst many, and that church became strong, especially in the New World, the Methodist Church. John Wesley founded the Methodist Church. Oh, look, we are at end. And yes, as I promised you, uh, that test 
will be on uh, Wednesday, on Friday, Friday the 13th. See that? And with that, I'm going to stop sharing. So thank you very much for your attention. Today is Tuesday, November the 10th. The 10th. Tomorrow's the 11th, Orton.